There are a number of cars which I've discussed on the channel, not just in this series, but even beyond it, which have had very complex or sometimes even comically troubled backstories or production runs. The MG SVR, of course, is a perfect example. It has, well, just that, an almost comedic level of trouble and various issues which happened both before and after production, which makes it a very interesting car to look into if you're looking to have a look at an interesting backstory. Other ones, though, might have had an interesting idea or just tried something different, but for whatever reasons, maybe they didn't quite achieve the goal, maybe they failed completely, maybe they didn't have the backing that they required, or maybe, in some rare occasions, maybe the car did achieve what it was intended for, but still, for various reasons, is obscure. And that's always the strange one. When you get a genuinely brilliant car, maybe even a race winner, for instance, but it's still not that well known in the grand scheme of things. That's kind of surprising when that happens. Then, though, you get some which are just straight up simple. Cars which were made by one guy in a shed kind of thing, just his idea of what he wanted his ultimate supercar to be. And then you have some which almost appeal to you could say the most age-old purpose of a supercar as far as the automotive world goes. Ferruccio Lamborghini, of course, is well known for this. He wanted to buy a Ferrari, they wouldn't sell him one, so he made something instead himself. And of course, Lamborghini was born, in at least the exotic sense. They were already building tractors, of course. This is a very similar occasion because there's a guy named Arash Farbaud, who's a British engineer, pretty well-off guy, and in the late 90s, he saw at the Le Mans the very, very dominant and very pretty Porsche 911 GT1. He wanted to buy one of the road cars, but for whatever reasons, Porsche apparently wouldn't sell him one. Maybe they were all accounted for, they didn't want to build any more, who knows, whatever the case may be, maybe they didn't consider him to have enough pedigree. That wouldn't be above certain companies to do that. Certain cars, of course, such as I believe the Enzo, the Bristol Fighter definitely did as well, they have kind of an invitation-only program. I believe the Ford GT of the latest shape also had that as well. And that's understandable on some occasions, but for something like a 911 GT1, it's kind of a shame, because it's the exact kind of car that a super fan would love to invest in. It's kind of the ultimate Porsche, at least before the Carrera GT came around. So, what he decided to do was, Lamborghini-style, build his own supercar. So, in the late 90s, he started production on, or started developing at least, one car, which came to be known as the Farbaud GT. And that is this car here. And it's a very interesting vehicle, because even to the untrained eye, you can pretty easily recognize the Porsche 911 GT1 influence, especially around the midsection. The curves over the wheel arches, the curves around the windows, the roof scoop, they are very, very clearly reminiscent of the 911 GT1. The back end is not quite as pretty, I would say, as the Porsche, because, of course, you have to fill in the back end on a road car. You, ha you can't have the exposed mesh, such as the GT1 race car has, or the Pagani Zonda R, for instance, also has that. So, what happened with this car? Why was there only one produced? Well, the reasons are kind of twofold, at least from what I've heard. One is simply that he didn't want the car to be mass production. He just wanted his own supercar. So from that point of view, making one of them makes perfect sense. You don't need to make tons of them, it was just his passion project. What I also heard, however, is that Porsche, not too surprisingly, if it is true, had some very clear issues with this car being produced, because it is a pretty blatant rip-off, you could genuinely say, of the 911 GT1. Does it have differences? Yes, for sure. But it's about as close as you can get, really. So what do you actually get from the Farbaud? Well, you get an Audi-sourced, kind of ironically, 2.8-litre twin-turbo V6 engine, interesting choice, mid-mounted, and it puts out about 620 horsepower. That's pretty good. That's a similar kind of level to other supercars at the time, similar to the Porsche itself. As far as performance goes, you're looking at 0 to 60 in about 3.2 seconds or thereabouts. Top end speed wise, well, there are a couple of different quotes. Some say 220 miles per hour. That seems a little bit ambitious. I'm not sure if it could go quite that quick especially given the aerodynamic design of the car, you're probably looking more so, I would say, at maybe 205, possibly 210 miles per hour. And as far as its weight, it's quoted, or at least claimed, 
to be 800 kilos, which is less than 1,800 pounds. Again, that seems very generous <laughs> to say that the car is that light. It's possible, of course, but that's even lighter than the Porsche by quite a lot. So, I don't know. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Who knows, for sure. I guess Arash Farbaud does. Now, later on, Farbaud decided to focus on a very different vehicle called the GTS, which is the car that many people who have heard of the brand probably recognise. It's a very small, very British exotic, in a similar vein to stuff like Noble, Ascari, various others as well. It's a small, roughly 400 horsepower uh, super sports car, you could say. And it's lightweight, much more affordable than this car, with a quoted value of about $1.8 million. The GTS, on the other hand, is no way near that. But the rights to that car were later sold as the Fabio GTS, and much more successfully later sold on again and became the Ginetta F400, which interestingly both the Farbaud and the Ginetta forms have been featured in the Test Drive Unlimited series under both of those names. I believe one was in the first game, which was Farbaud, and I think the Ginetta was in the second game, if I recall correctly. Those are great cars, but they're not exactly on the same exotic level as essentially a GT1 homologated streetcar, or about as close to it as you can get. So later on he turned his attention onward again, now again under the new name Arash instead of Farbaud, and built the Arash AF10, which was a Ferrari Enzo-style supercar, never reached production, it was later revamped and slightly redesigned in 2016, also as a concept car, quoted to have over 2,000 horsepower in hybrid form, again, didn't reach production, and probably more famously, and once again, as you can see in the pictures of this video featured at Goodwood, he later built the AF8, which is a slightly bland looking, but nevertheless pretty quick, V10 engined, 205 mile per hour supercar, uses a Judd V10, pretty decent performance, but again, not exactly the best known thing in the world, and it looks a little bit too much like a kit car for my liking. This one, on the other hand, you could say it still looks like a kit car to some degree, or a really good replica, but then again, so is something like a super performance Daytona, or a GT40, and look how great they are. This one is definitely the shining star from either the Farbaud or the Arash lineage, and it's the one which actually went past the concept form to being a road car, and it still sits in the Arash dealership today. It's his personal car, and I think it's a pretty cool one. It's a very undervalued supercar for obvious reasons, super obscure, super exclusive by definition, very deliberately so, and as you can see from some of the livery of it in this video, it also ran in the Gumball in 1999. Pretty cool car, I think, certainly an unsung hero, and a car which, given its performance and the car which inspired it, a multiple Time Le Mans winner, it definitely deserves to have more chatter. But that's it for this pick overall. Of course, I'll see you guys next time. If you want to check out more awesome cars like this, then of course you can click through to see those at the end. And for now, as always, thanks for watching.